Abiola Akintola. Yes. How are you feeling, brother? I'm doing great. Are you? Great, great, great. Yes, yes. Thank you for having us. You are very welcome, man. A day before you leave for China. Yes. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for doing what you do. And for many people who don't know you, where, where were you born? Well, I was born in a little village uh, of West Africa, Nigeria. This place is called Okeho. And it's mountainous in, in structure. That's why they call it Okeho. And I uh, grew up there and spent about the first 20 years of my life. And of course, I went to, to high school and uh, experienced all the old village stuff. I used to be a good herder, a farmer. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's a very small village, you know. We practice a lot of culture. And, uh, and that's my fault. Excellent, excellent. So did you go to art school in Nigeria? Yes, I went to art school in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom happened to be a sculptor. Mm -hmm. My father was a police officer. And um, while we were going to school at that time, I wasn't really studying art. I was studying science because that's my father wanted me to be a medical doctor. But on the other hand, my mom was always encouraging me to not leave the family tradition of sculptors. You know, and don't, you know, she was always advising me not to leave that alone because she could foresee a lot of good things coming. Hmm. So we have, I have other brothers that are artists as well. Interesting. Yes. Now, I know you work in several different mediums, uh, painting, sculpting, and a combination of those different mediums, but if you could tell us about some of the series that you've become famous for and the series you're working on now. Well, I uh, started off uh, learning the techniques of the old masters, and uh, the Van Gogh, the uh, Rembrandt in school. So we used to paint on canvases and charcoals and on paper, and uh, I moved to the United States learning how to sculpt in a in more technical way because the, the uh, conventional way of sculpting was always been uh, the one that I was available to while I was in school. You know, so, but here, they have other methods. Here you can use um, machineries and uh, computers or whatever to manipulate stuff. So I learned all those other techniques while I got to the United States. But let me put it this way, the, 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 the learning part of it was uh, something that has always been in it because uh, the, the process of learning always have been very easily available to me. For example, if I see you doing something that is great, that I like, I can borrow from that. You know, with, even sometimes without you knowing it because that is part of the way we always learn. So we always recycle ideas. I cannot say that I've learned everything while I was in my village or in my school. Other things have influenced me to this point. Excellent. Yes. So what were some of the pivotal, pivotal moments in your career as you've been here in the Chicagoland area that has really made a difference in your art career? Well, two things, and I want to give glory to God Almighty for even bringing me to the United States, and I thank the United States government for providing the opportunity to be able to practice what we do, because in my country, it could be very challenging for me. And I thank you too for bringing me all the opportunities that you've always given to me. It actually, it wasn't given to me, it was handed to me. It's like, hey, Abiola, I love you. There's no other way I could express myself. Exhibit here. You gave me all kinds of opportunities. So I thank you for that. Yeah. So, um, but the pivotal point of my career happened when, for example, when you told me to do the contest for the Olympics, you called me while I was in the studio. And um, you say, hey, Abiola, there's an opportunity here. Uh, are you available for this? I said, what is it? And he said, um, if 
if you can contest for the 2008 Olympics. About 1,500 artists are contesting for that. Maybe you can, you can be your take. And I said, well, I left everything and I focused on, the, on that piece. Well, that gave me one very good break. It's a break that we've always been looking for. I love boxing. And a friend of mine once told me that we are all boxers in life, whether we like it or not. And one of the ways by which you know a good boxer is they box a little bit, they run away. Not only that, they have to impress the judges. So they have to be at the right place, at the right time, on that ring. Even, even though the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, audience can be sharing that, that person up, it doesn't really matter, it's what the judges are saying that matters. So you push me to be highlighted by the museum, for example. And so they saw that. And when they saw that, I banked on that for a while. Then I created a group after that. I said, well, let me do on this for now. The 2008 Olympics run up, whatever. And they flew me to uh, Switzerland first class and we were there for like a few days and I, I had uh, a very great moment of my life. So, and this is what they told me while I was there, say, use this opportunity and turn it to your advantage. I didn't really know how to turn it. I created a group and um, we're headed by James Gatewood, Caroline Hucker, uh, some of my friends and we say, okay, here comes the moment where I think I can turn this around. And that was the time Obama, the next the year after that was the Obama election. So we, I, I did a piece of Obama's and the group said, okay, let's give it a title. I said, okay, I, I titled that One Day of Rain. One Day of Rain can cure a thousand years of drought. Because in Africa, we have two seasons, the rainy season and the dry season. During the dry season, everybody is always thirsty, looking for water. So, but to, to look at that proverb in its context, it's not just looking for water. It has been something that we have been thirsting or yearning for in the United States to at least have a black president. So all the drought of those years that we didn't have a black president, we had an opportunity where Obama just came in. So when he came in, that was the drop of rain. So I did a piece and called it One Day of Rain. And we, um, the group said, okay, let's do something that we say, okay, it's going to be $1 million to begin with. And I've never sold a piece for $1 million, but it, it was just a way by which we can create that momentum. A great leader knows how to use momentum to their advantage, not only that. Opp uh, temptations, unlike opportunities, we always give us many chances. But when I see, when any time I see a very genuine opportunity, and what I mean by genuine opportunity is something that is very divine in nature, that is that has, that has a definite and a defined a, a definite plan or goal or an end result in it, it, give, it always gives me a bony heart desire. So I was obsessed at that time. Obsessed at that time. Because um, the reality of that fact was that we had three offers, and I'm not going to mention those offers um, for the Obama. And after they saw this piece in China, uh, uh, this fellow, this great artist in China, one of China's great masters, Scott, has given me the opportunity to be the first black man whose work will be used to open the All Asian Games.